Today's case is one that is very near and dear to my heart. I had the amazing opportunity to work directly with the family of Solomon Herford and hear from them everything that is going on in this case. I got to speak with his mother, Sophia, and his brother, Ramses, who had endless stories about just how amazing of a person Solomon was. And all they want right now is for Solomon's story to be heard by as many people as possible. This case has not been investigated the way that it should have from the very beginning, and no matter how much evidence the family has presented, they are being ignored by all agencies they've contacted. We want to put as much pressure as possible on those responsible for investigating this case to let them know that we still care about Solomon and we won't stop until justice is served in this case. With that being said, I had the opportunity to review police reports, autopsy reports, text messages, ring doorbell footage, among many other documents. Much of the information that I'm sharing with you today comes directly from those documents as well as subjective reporting from family members. Any and all accusations or allegations are just that. They're not being stated as fact, but as my own personal opinion that I formed based on the information that was provided to me. Just wanted to get that disclaimer out there. So, without any further delay, let's get into this case. Today, we are going to be discussing the suspicious death of Solomon Herford. Solomon Herford was born to his mother, Sophia Lewis, and Ronaldo Herford, and he had an older brother, only about 18 months older, named Ramses, who was born to a different father than Solomon. Ramses' father died in an airplane crash when Sophia was seven months pregnant, so Ramses grew up with Solomon as his baby brother and believed that Ronaldo was his father for most of his life. That was the father figure that he knew. Originally, Ronaldo and Sophia met when they were young. According to Sophia, Ronaldo comes from a relatively well-off family. They own a local go-kart track in Detroit, which allowed them to have a nice big house, as well as lots of connections around the community. Because of the business, they were well-known and respected in the area as an upstanding family in their local area. But... Things did not work out for Sophia and Ronaldo, and by April of 2009, they became separated, with their divorce being finalized in October. Shortly after the separation, Ronaldo started dating another woman, Cherie, and a few years later, they are married with a new daughter of their own. Solomon was described as being supportive, kind, and intelligent. He started reading at the age of three and was in the gifted program growing up. He was very bright, especially in the subjects of math and science. In addition to his intelligence, he was also known as being very social, outgoing, and having a strong personality. He was protective of those he loved most, especially his older brother, Ramses. Ramses said that even though he was technically the older brother, Solomon was wise beyond his years, so he was sometimes the one giving the brotherly advice. Back in 2020, when Ramses came out to his family as gay, Solomon was right there to encourage his brother and support him. He told Ramses that he should not be bothered by what other people think of him, and if anybody does have a problem with his sexuality, they don't deserve Ramses' presence in their lives anyways. That is the kind of supportive, protective brother Solomon was. Hi, I'm Sophia. I'm Solomon's mom. Hi, I'm Ramses. I'm Solomon's brother. And first and foremost, we want to give a huge thank you to Rachel Shannon for covering Solomon's story. She did an awesome job. We can't say thank you enough. Um, I just wanted to share some information about Solomon and just speak to his character, um, specifically his empathy. Um, when he was in preschool, he was four years old and he was a really shy kid, but a new student named Alec joined his class and Alec had a condition where his bones could break pretty easily. So a lot of the kids were scared to play with him, uh, but Solomon not only befriended Alec, they became best friends. And so we had lots of fun play dates between the two of them. And Solomon was able to show all the other kids that, you know, you can play with him and, and not hurt him and here's how you do that. So I was really proud of him as were his teachers. Um, for showing the leadership and just showing that empathy. Um, and then another quick story, when we first moved to New York City, we lived in Washington Heights. Uh, Solomon attended PS 128 and graduated from there. And he came home one day really late, about an hour and a half later than normal. And I didn't know where he was, he didn't have a cell phone. Um, and then he showed up at the door 
and he was very passionate and, and exasperated about um, our war veterans. He said, mom, do you know how much they sacrifice for this country? And we don't take care of them because he had been speaking to um, a vet that was there at the Starbucks on 168th who was in a wheelchair. So that's just um, a couple of quick stories, but it just speaks to his character. And Solomon was always um, caring for the people closest to him and always um, looking out for those that are most vulnerable in our society. Yeah, and two months before he passed, I decided to leave college early and move back in with my mom for mental health reasons. And it was three weeks after that, he made a surprise visit. And um, it was during that time we discussed traveling the United States together, starting a business. And he just had genuine excitement for exploring the neighborhood and eventually moving in with us and exploring Chicago together. So um, his excitement brought me a renewed excitement and joy for life because I was going through a dark period and it just speaks to the brightness of his soul. And we really appreciate any contribution you can make to the GoFundMe. Um, and we really hope to have justice served soon. We really thank you. Thank you. When Solomon was younger, growing up, he, Ramses, and Sophia all lived in Chicago before they moved to New York, New York in the Washington Heights neighborhood. It was around when Solomon was in seventh grade that Sophia started to ponder the idea of Solomon moving in with his father, Ronaldo, in Detroit, Michigan, because he was being a little bit disruptive in class and getting detention frequently. However, at the time, instead of Solomon moving in with Ronaldo for his 8th grade year, in August of 2015, Sophia, Ramses, and Solomon all moved to Detroit so that the kids could stay together and have both of their parents in similar locations. For the arrangement, the boys lived with Sophia on the weekdays, and Ronaldo would get them on the weekends. However, this move did not end up working out, so they stayed in Detroit for seven months before moving back to New York in March of 2016. After this move, by around ninth grade, Solomon was starting to show some naughty behaviors, as Ramsey put it. He was skipping class, maybe staying out late with friends, and not coming home when he was supposed to. In my opinion, these are very normal things that some kids will go through. They have this rebellious stage where they want to think for themselves, they don't want to follow the rules, and they want to test out their independence. And in at least my experience, that's sort of the baby of the family, that's sort of their job to go out and cause some trouble. But when you're a single mother with two boys close in age, this kind of acting out can be very stressful and even overwhelming. So, Sophia thought that maybe moving in with his father would be good for him. So, by 2017, Solomon moved to Detroit, Michigan to live with his father. Fast forwarding just a bit during COVID, so by late March of 2020, Sophia and Ramses actually moved back to Chicago, living just over four hours away from Solomon in Detroit. But even throughout the time of his family living in New York and Chicago, their distance did not stop Solomon from maintaining his close relationship with his brother and mother. They took trips together wherever they could, especially up until late 2019 before COVID. They went to Montreal, D.C., San Francisco, Miami, L.A., and more. They visited colleges like Stanford and Princeton. When they weren't spending time together, they texted or called almost every single day. Now, while living in the home with Ronaldo and Cherie, by all accounts, things were going well. Sophia didn't hear of many problems within the home, and it appeared that he was happy and safe there. But it turned out that things may not have been what they appeared to be within the home. According to family members, there were things going on in that home that Sophia never would have approved for her son. For example, allegedly, the adults in the home were constantly drinking alcohol around the children. This wasn't too bad, except for the fact that they were allowing the children to drink as well, starting as young as 11. To make it worse, Cherie's sister even posted a photo on Facebook of an intoxicated 11-year-old Solomon, which Sophia confronted her about. Then they realized that Ronaldo seemed to have a bit of a temper. 
There was one instance where Solomon had to break up a physical altercation between Ronaldo and another sibling in the home. By June of 2019, Solomon started seeing a therapist to sort out some of the issues he was having, and it was at that time that he told a therapist that he didn't really feel welcome in the home. This was a concern that Sophia relayed to Rinaldo and Cherie in a thoughtful manner, hoping to make them aware and open a dialogue, but that didn't seem to change much. Meanwhile, as Solomon was approaching the summer after high school graduation, so June of 2020, the summer after he turned 17, his mother, Sophia, was looking into different volunteering opportunities for Solomon to do over the summer as a character-building activity. That previous summer, he had accomplished so much and did so many different things, so that was the plan for the summer of 2020. She sent Ronaldo all sorts of different ideas for things to get Solomon into to grow his potential and just help guide him towards being the best person he could be. But... Ronaldo wasn't interested in any of it. He straight up told Sophia that Solomon was grown and that volunteering wasn't going to make a difference. To this, Sophia responded to Ronaldo, so you're just gonna give up on our son? But again, that didn't make him change his mind. There was also a plan for Solomon to come to Chicago for the summer to spend some time with his mom like he normally did, but Ronaldo informed Sophia that he wouldn't be doing that this summer either. She asked if he could spend at least two to three weeks with her so they could do some summer enrichment together, but he wouldn't allow that either. As that was happening with Solomon graduating high school, the family celebrating this accomplishment and dealing with all the drama that Ronaldo was causing, Ramses was attending college at Northeastern University. During the first few months, he stayed living with Sophia in Chicago, attending school remotely during COVID, so April to May of 2020. After that, he flew to Boston to attend school in person. A few years later, he planned to return home for the summer of 2022, taking a break from school to work on his own mental health for reasons that I will get into in just a minute. But when the plan was discussed of Ramsey's returning back to Chicago, Solomon would call his mom asking for flight details and trying to figure out exactly when Ramsey's would be back because he was so excited to see him in person once he returned. He wanted to be right there when his brother was in Chicago. Ramsey's returned back to Chicago by August of 2022 and it was around this time that he revealed to his mom how things were really going in the home when he stayed with Ronaldo, Cherie, and the other siblings. He said that it felt like him, Solomon, and the other older sibling were all treated much differently than the younger two children, both who were born to Cherie and Ronaldo. Again, Ronaldo wasn't Ramsey's biological father, but for most of his life, he believed he was because his biological father was deceased just prior to Ramsey's birth, so Ronaldo was the one male influence he had in his life. So being treated so differently than the younger children was something that bothered him and make him less likely to stay in contact. While he was away at school, his mental health progressively worsened due to his negative self-image and he would later be diagnosed with persistent depressive disorder. So even though he was away from the home, he felt like things between him and Ronaldo weren't healthy. So Sophia actually encouraged him to call Ronaldo and clear things up and maybe that would make him feel better. With that being said, I wanna take now as a moment to mention that all throughout Solomon and Ramsey's living with Ronaldo, visiting back and forth, spending time with each parent, Sophia worked her hardest to maintain a healthy relationship with Ronaldo for herself and her children. She encouraged her boys to talk to their father if they had any issues. She encouraged them to spend time with him and form a healthy father-son bond. She believes that a son should have a close bond with their father, given that they are the men in the family and it's just such a different relationship than a mother and a son. Meanwhile, according to family, Ronaldo was constantly trying to drive a wedge between Sophia and the boys. He would say that Sophia was trying to take them away from him. He would say negative things about her parenting. All things to try and make them want to stay with him at all times and never go to visit their mom. Either way, after Ramsey's returned back to Chicago by September 15th, 2022, Solomon packed up his car and drove the four and a half hours it took to drive from Detroit to Chicago to visit his brother. 
According to family, Solomon actually left Detroit without telling anyone, including Ronaldo, Sophia, or Ramses. He drove straight to Chicago, just showing up on Sophia's doorstep that same evening with his suitcase. During that trip, Solomon and Ramses excitedly talked about the future. He was excited about him and Ramses possibly starting a business together. They talked about their travel plans. Sophia and Solomon even walked around Chicago together for an hour, pointing out different places where he could play basketball and other sports once he moved there. They talked about going to open houses because Ramses and Sophia were planning on finding a house big enough for all of them to live together. He spent the following four days in Chicago with his mom and brother before returning to Detroit by September 19th, 2022. It was also around this time in August and September of 2022 when Solomon started telling others that maybe it was time for him to leave Detroit. On a call with his mom, he said, I don't think there's anything left for me in Detroit. He also told his paternal grandmother that he was thinking about possibly moving to Chicago back with his mother soon. In one text he sent to his family group chat with Ramses and two of his first cousins, he even said, quote, I don't want to be in Detroit anymore. It's draining. By October 8th, he FaceTimed with his mom and told her that he was so excited because he was going to be attending his first ever college party. He was going to a party at Michigan State University for Halloween. Sophia would later find out from Solomon's friends that he was going to be attending the party with several of his friends and he also told them that after attending this party, he would be moving in with his mom. His friend said, quote, Solomon always talked about his mom. We were excited for him and looking forward to meeting his mom because we had heard so much about her. He wanted us to come visit after he moved. So again, this all just shows that he might have had plans and probably did have plans to move to Chicago from Detroit. Now, going back to the party, of course, when he told his mom about the party, his mom was worried and told him not to let anybody touch his drink and all of those general safety rules for your first college party. And to this, Solomon told his mom not to worry. He said she knows he doesn't drink alcohol, but he should still be careful even if it was just a glass of water because you never know what someone could do to your drink, even if it is just water or soda. You never know. By October 9th, Solomon spent the day with his father, Ronaldo, helping him tend to a big warehouse owned by Solomon's grandmother. That morning, he was with Ronaldo, most likely cleaning and moving equipment. That afternoon, he returned back home and relaxed for a bit. At that time, Solomon had been chatting with the girl, Bianca, who he met on Instagram and had been messaging with for the past few days. He messaged her that day, saying that he was at home after helping his dad. Later that afternoon, it was initially reported that Solomon and Ronaldo went to the family's go-kart racetrack. There, Solomon mowed the lawns around the property, However, this bit of information is disputed because at that time, the family's go-kart track was inoperable. It was out of business and there were no tracks running. So there really was no reason for them to be there. I will come back to this in just a few minutes. That evening, at some point in helping out his dad, there was apparently some sort of heated argument between Ronaldo and Solomon, which resulted in Solomon leaving the property early without helping to pack up or close up the property. He then returned back home where he stayed for the night. According to what has been confirmed about that night, we do know that Solomon played 2K with several friends where he was talking and joking as normal. While playing, he was also on FaceTime with Bianca for several hours into the morning of October 10th. That call ended at 9.51 a.m. on October 10th. For the hours that followed, Solomon spent some time on social media, commenting on different posts from Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, as well as responding to messages from Instagram and text messages from his group chat with Ramses and Sophia. The last message Solomon sent to this group chat was at 12.08 p.m. By that evening at 5.20 p.m., it appears that for whatever reason, Solomon wanted to leave the home. He was captured on a ring doorbell camera walking to his car and getting in. As he was walking out, you can hear what sounds like Ronaldo's voice in the background talking to Solomon. You then hear the voice of a woman yelling, it ain't that big, meaning it ain't that serious. But after getting into his car and turning on the ignition, 
it was clear that he was being watched by someone in a truck, presumably one of their neighbors, in what appears to be an attempt to block or intimidate him from leaving. It seemed that at this point, Ronaldo and Solomon had an argument. Solomon left the house to leave in his car, and as they were arguing, another neighbor drove up and attempted to block him in or stop him from leaving. On that ring doorbell camera, you then see the neighbor, who I will now identify as a man named Richard, walking past Solomon's car and staring at him until he returned back to his own home and went inside. After that, there is some time missing from the footage. The next thing we know, 20 minutes later, by 5.44 p.m., the ring doorbell captures Solomon walking towards his home from the direction of his neighbor Rich's home. It is presumed that Solomon spent those 20 minutes at Rich's home. Rich later admitted that the two did have a conversation, but said that it was just small talk, so we don't know exactly what the conversation was about. By 5.58 p.m., the last communication from Solomon's phone is sent. It is a text message to a friend. After this, we initially don't know anything about Solomon's whereabouts for two days. People are messaging Solomon, not getting any response. Bianca even sent him a middle finger emoji, I'm assuming because she's annoyed at his lack of communication, at him just ghosting her. Even Sophia and Ramses, who he texted or call on almost a daily basis, hadn't heard from Solomon. Nobody knew what he was doing or where he was. That was until 4.52 p.m. on October 12, 2022, when 911 received a call from Ronaldo to report that he had just found his son, 20-year-old Solomon Herford, dead in his bedroom from an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. When officers arrived to the scene, they went down to the basement where Solomon's bedroom was located. They went inside his bedroom, and there they found Solomon lying face up on the floor with a single gunshot wound to his head. His skin was cold to the touch and his body already showed signs of rigor mortis. On the bed, they found a 9mm handgun. Now, from this point on, the story gets very confusing and a little bit hard to follow because there are several different stories that are being told, several different versions of events, several different people telling police, family, Sophia, Ramses, all sorts of different things. I will try to tell you everything we know in the most concise way possible, but just as a warning, it gets pretty tangled from here. In the stories that Ronaldo would initially tell, he first tells investigators that he believes Solomon shot himself by accident in the chin. He would also tell friends that Solomon used his grandfather's gun, a Smith & Wesson revolver, to accidentally shoot himself because it had a janky trigger. I want to note that police did find a Smith & Wesson in the home, but it was located in a kitchen cabinet above the fridge. So, there are now two weapons involved, but again, the 9mm was the one found in the bedroom. But then, Ronaldo changes the story and says that he actually believes it was an intentional suicide by shooting himself once again in the chin. He told officers that he wasn't actually known to have any mental health issues, but he said that Solomon didn't really have anything going on in his life. He said that all Solomon did was smoke weed and stay at home. He told investigators that he didn't have a job and didn't pay bills. However, we know that this was a lie. Solomon did have a job and did pay bills. He was employed at the airport, a job which he really enjoyed. Now, I do want to note that he quit his job on August 26, 2022, the same day that Ramses returned home to Chicago from Boston. That also shows, though, how excited he was for his brother's return. But with this whole statement, we know that he also helped out with the bills. So it's not known why Ronaldo would tell officers that all he did was stay in his room and smoke weed and didn't contribute financially when we know he did. In another story, he said that there had been a suicide note written in the notes app, which explained his decision to take his life. In another story, he said that the suicide note was actually the screensaver on his phone. To note, the phone was found face up on Solomon's chest. 
So this is just another inconsistency. If Solomon had a suicide note as the screensaver on his phone, how in the world did his father mistake this as an accident at first? It does not make any sense. The next thing the family tells investigators is that they actually hadn't seen Solomon for two days before they found his body. They said that Solomon went downstairs to his room in the basement on the 10th, but for the two days that followed, he apparently just stayed downstairs playing video games and hanging out by himself without ever leaving his room. Ronaldo stated that he hadn't gone down there to check on him and hadn't seen him come upstairs for any reason. When Cherie was talking to others about the case, she also mentioned that on the day prior, on October 11th, she had to do laundry down in the basement. When she was down there, she thought of checking on Solomon, but she got too scared to knock on the door or open it. There is so much wrong with these statements. First of all, Everything that Solomon would need to survive is on the first floor of the home. The food, the kitchen, even the bathroom is on that floor. There is no bathroom in the basement. So if Solomon wanted to eat, he would have had to come up to the first floor to make something. Or if you want to argue that Solomon stashed snacks in his room and ate them during that time, sure, you can argue that but there's no way that he would have been able to go those two entire days without even using the restroom. That's just not possible, and it doesn't make sense that he would just stay in his room and pee in a bottle or something to avoid coming out of his room. That made absolutely no sense. But okay, you could argue that maybe Ronaldo and Cherie just didn't see him come upstairs when he did go, but that doesn't really seem likely either. Ronaldo works from home most days in his home office, which is either in or near the kitchen, which faces the basement door. So, if Solomon came upstairs at any, any point, chances are Ronaldo would have seen him at least once. With that being said, did Ronaldo not think it was strange when he didn't see his son for two entire days? That was completely out of the ordinary, so why was this not a red flag to begin with? Then, when it came to Cherie's statement, if she didn't know what happened to Solomon, why was she scared to open his door? We know that there was actually blood pooling right by the door, which leaked to the other side of the room. So if you were standing on the outside of the bedroom with the door closed, you would have seen a little puddle of blood. Did she just not see that when she went by the door? That doesn't seem likely either. So already, the story of how Solomon was found is very sketchy and nobody seems to have a straight answer. They first tell investigators that they didn't see him in the home for two days while everyone was home and didn't think to check on Solomon once. With that being said, I want to make note now that as I stated earlier, his last cell phone communication was at 5.58 p.m. on the 10th. As we saw from the previous days, he is very active on social media, commenting on things and responding to messages very quickly. So it's thought that around 6 p.m. is the time when Solomon was shot. However, when speaking with some of Solomon's friends and his coach from the basketball team, there was yet another new story. Ronaldo was now saying that he and Cherie were actually on vacation when Solomon shot himself and that they only discovered his body once they returned back home. Once again, we know that this is a lie. We know that he was home during those days. As I stated earlier, Ronaldo's voice was heard on that ring doorbell camera just minutes before it's thought that Solomon was shot. So why is he lying? Who's to say? In addition to all of these very conflicting stories that have been given up to this point, we have what I believe is the biggest lie of all. And even after speaking with Sophia and Ramses, even after digging through all of the information, I cannot for the life of me understand why anybody would lie about this. As I mentioned before, Ronaldo stated to police that Solomon took his own life by shooting himself through the chin. However, the minute officers stepped into the scene, they knew that he was not shot through the chin. 
According to the autopsy, there was a contact gunshot wound to the back lower area of his head with the bullet entering through his occipital skull and entering through the left frontal area. That means that it started in the back of his head, traveled diagonally upwards, and then exited through the front upper portion of his face on his forehead. He did have a small laceration to his chin, but it wasn't anything significant and definitely was not caused by a gunshot wound. We don't know exactly what caused the gash on his chin, but it's thought that it was either intentionally placed there by someone who wanted investigators to believe that it was a gunshot wound, or he was in some sort of altercation before his death, which left that small gash. I also want to note that the medical examiner found absolutely no traces of alcohol or drugs, including weed, in his system. So no, he wasn't just sitting there and smoking weed all day before he got up and shot himself. With what the autopsy found, as I stated earlier, it appears that he was shot on the right side of the back of his head with the bullet exiting the left side of his forehead. According to a blood spatter found at the scene, it appears that Solomon was lying on the floor on his right side when he was shot. Then, according to lividity, it appears that he was lying on his back after being shot. That means that if he shot himself while lying on the floor, he would have used his right hand. So, he would have been lying on his right side while also shooting himself with his right hand in the back of the head. In general, that just does not make sense and it adds up to this whole situation being so odd. If you believe what you've been told up to this point, then you believe that Solomon went into his room shortly after trying to leave in his car. He grabbed the 9mm gun, lied down on the floor on his right side, and then used his right hand to reach to the back of his head and then shot himself while lying on the floor. Then the gun flew onto his bed. He laid there for two days while none of his family members thought to check on him for those two entire days. Make any of this make sense. You can't because it doesn't. After reporting the death to police on the 12th, finally, Sophia was called by Cherie to let her know what happened to her son. Obviously, this was devastating news. Nobody wants to find out that your beloved child is dead and that nobody found his body for two days when he was literally in the home in which he lived. But added to that, he apparently shot himself. This was just not something that Sophia or Ramses were willing to accept, and it's for a good reason. As if the information about the initial situation wasn't bad enough, when Sophia arrived to the scene, she saw that Solomon's car was parked directly in front of the house. For the two days that Solomon's body lie in that basement, his car hadn't been touched. Inside of the trunk of that car, Sophia found that Solomon had packed a huge garbage bag full of freshly cleaned clothes such as underwear, work clothes, and everyday clothes. He also packed important documents from previous jobs as well as his high school diploma and birth certificate. This just shows once again that Solomon was planning on leaving Detroit. Months later, in June of 2023, she also found out via police photos taken at the scene where his body was found that there were bloody footprints all in various stages of drying. Some of them looked fresh in those photos, which made sense if they had just found his body and were walking around and trying to figure out what was going on in the scene but some of the footprints were old and dry, indicating that someone had possibly found his body earlier and walked around, but never reported it until two days later. To note, Sophia received 25 autopsy photos from the medical examiner in 2022, but it excluded the photos of the bloody shoe prints and photos showing both Solomon's sneakers and his neatly folded hoodies on his bedroom floor where he was shot, showing that he was in the final stages of packing things. This is yet another very disturbing detail that was hidden from the family for whatever reason. Then, in the days and weeks after Solomon's death, more strange circumstances continued to happen. The day after Solomon's death, Ronaldo was sitting on his front porch and drinking when a friend asked to see the gun that shot his son. He then ran inside and brought out the gun to show them. According to witnesses, he seemed happy to do this, not bothered at all. Again, 
one day after finding his son dead. I don't know about you, but if my loved one had just shot themselves or been shot by someone else and I was grieving the day after it happened, if someone asked me to see the gun that did it, I would tell them to leave because that is not an appropriate question to begin with. But then the fact that he happily went and got the gun and was like, here you go, here's the gun that shot my son, that is just absurd. Then by October 15th, the family held a balloon release to honor Solomon's memory. At that event, Ronaldo appeared in unusually good spirits. When he was sharing the story of how they found his dead, bloody body, he showed no emotion. He was cheerful, and when recounting the discovery of his son's body, he said it as if it was just another story. This was three days after apparently just finding his son's body. He didn't show any emotion. He didn't seem to be affected by it. He didn't seem to be mourning nothing. He was very nonchalant about the entire thing. Wednesday, going back to Wednesday. Solomon, um, we were looking for Solomon. I called his cell phone. He didn't answer. Uh, I FaceTimed him. He didn't answer. I went to the stairs and I screamed for my baby. Solomon didn't respond again. That's four times and he wants to respond to any one of the four. So at that point, I figured something wasn't right. I ran down the stairs to my baby's room. When I got to his door, the door open like uh, I thought I was gonna push the door open like I normally do. But the door didn't budge. With the door not budging, I figured he was in there smoking weed or something and blocked the door. He's not supposed to smoke weed in the house. Got the other kids in the house. So I started pushing the door on the door. And I was looking in as I pushed the door on the door. And I see my baby legs, you know. And then at that point, I automatically rolled him a little bit, pushed the door a little bit harder, and got inside the door. Solomon was laying up against the door. So I reached down and grabbed my baby and lifted him up. Uh, when I did that, I saw a pool of blood around my baby head. I dove on the ground and I lay right next to my bed. A lot of y'all is probably looking at me like, after what I went through, finding my son the way I found him. How is he up here? How is he in good spirits? Um, and it, it is tough, but I know my son. I love my son. And I'm gonna fight for it. And I'm gonna fight for anybody else in this position that feel like their life ain't worth living because of the struggle they want. As I say in so many of my videos, once again, we can't necessarily judge how someone responds in traumatic situations. Some people are very good at hiding their emotions. Some people are not comfortable with showing their emotions to others, especially when speaking in front of people. But from an outside perspective, I think he is way too calm and collected when speaking about his son's death. That sentiment is shared by both Sophia and Ramses, who were deeply disturbed by his demeanor at the balloon release. Many other friends and family members were also disturbed by his demeanor at the balloon release and reluctantly shared this with Sophia in the days and weeks after. So, nobody was alone in this concern. By Christmas of that year, Ramses had planned to go see Ronaldo in Detroit for the holiday. He texted Ronaldo about the plans, but Ronaldo didn't respond. 
He then sent Ronaldo screenshots of his travel itinerary, but that too was ignored. He only responded once he was made aware that Sophia was looking into the details surrounding Solomon's death. In general, both Ronaldo and Cherie were very nonchalant about Solomon's death, not caring how it affected the rest of the family. But as soon as he found out that Sophia was looking more into it, that's what piqued his interest. And that's what made him apparently respond to Ramsey's travel plans when before he couldn't be bothered. Then Ronaldo started talking to other family members, saying some very negative, demeaning things about Sophia. They told people that because of how invested Sophia was in finding the truth, she was mentally unwell, that she should just accept this as a suicide. Ronaldo wanted people to stop asking questions, to stop talking about the death in general. He wanted to move on as fast as humanly possible, even in the days just after it happened. He wanted no time to grieve, no time to make sense of it all. He didn't question what would have made Solomon want to take his own life. He didn't try to retrace his steps and see what went wrong and why. He just wanted to move past it. At this point, I think there's more than enough to say that something about this situation is not right. I truly don't believe that a father and a stepmother who just found their son dead would be lying and changing their stories this much. There's so much here to show that maybe police should look into this case at least a little bit to see if there's something more. But that isn't what happened. Instead, police briefly inspected the scene, got the autopsy complete, and closed the case. They ruled it as a suicide right away, no further questions. But I want to note that when coming to this conclusion, they did that without speaking to Sophia or Ramses or anybody else who knew Solomon and could speak to his state of mind before his death. If they had, they would have seen that his father lied about him just smoking weed and not working. As I mentioned before, there was also ring doorbell footage that captured Solomon walking outside and then getting into his car shortly after arguing with his father and then trying to leave the house before speaking to this neighbor just minutes before his death. However, police never bothered to look into this footage either. If they had, they would have known that there was an argument with his father. They would have known that he spent 20 minutes with that neighbor, Rich, shortly before his death. There are so many things that police simply chose not to look into. Some family members feel like it's negligence or laziness. Others believe that the police department is actively trying to cover all of this up because Ronaldo's family is so loved and respected in their community. If you haven't figured it out by this point, Many people, including Sophia and Ramses, believe that Solomon was killed, that this was not a suicide, but a homicide staged to look like a suicide. Not only are the circumstances surrounding Solomon's death suspicious, but nobody who truly knew Solomon believes that he was suicidal in the slightest. He was getting his life together. He literally told Ramsey's aunt, who Solomon grew up with as his aunt as well, that he was getting his life together on his final birthday on August 17th, 2022, after years of not speaking with her. He had a job. He was hanging out with friends and talking to girls. He was excited about possibly moving back to Chicago, as we can see from the bag he had packed in his car. He had tangible plans, including attending that Halloween party and starting a business with his brother. These are not things that someone will do if they are about to take their own life. So at this point, you might be wondering, what would cause someone to want to hurt Solomon? What would the motive be? Well, there is some information that Sophia found out after Solomon's death that truly surprised everybody involved and honestly blows this whole case wide open. Some people believe that Ronaldo, as well as his neighbor Rich, were involved in selling marijuana in the area. When Solomon was 19 years old in September of 2021, Ronaldo got his son started in selling for him and making him money. Going back to earlier in the timeline, as I stated, Ronaldo was very resistant to Solomon possibly leaving Detroit, even referring to 17-year-old Solomon as grown. It's possible that he wouldn't allow Solomon to leave because he was planning on having him work for him. 
Later, Solomon expressed via text message on his 19th birthday in August 2021 that he wished Ronaldo hadn't convinced him to stay, referring to a June 2021 conversation that Ronaldo pretended to know nothing about. The whole idea of Solomon selling drugs for Rich and Ronaldo is confirmed via text messages found on Ronaldo's phone. In September of 2021, there are multiple cryptic text messages where Solomon is asking Rich if they have crud to sell. This continues through August of 2022 when they are still discussing costs, how much to sell for, even proving that Solomon would visit Rich's house to get the drugs. With that being said, it is possible that the operation of selling drugs might be running out of one of the properties owned by Ronaldo, specifically that warehouse I mentioned earlier. As I stated, Solomon spent the morning of October 9th at that warehouse before later going to the go-kart track. However, as I stated, that go-kart track is no longer operating. So, that could have been a lie to cover for the fact that Solomon may had been at the warehouse where the weed was instead. We know that while working with his father, there was an argument leading to Solomon going home before his father. According to what we now know, it's possible that after going home, Solomon did his laundry and then packed up his clothes and put them in his car. That night, he played video games and talked on FaceTime. The following afternoon, there appears to be another argument between Solomon and Ronaldo. Part of this is captured on the ring doorbell. Solomon is seen walking out to his car before he is blocked in by somebody else. It's possible that the person who was blocking him and intimidating him from leaving is another associate who sells drugs with Ronaldo. After being prevented from leaving, Solomon presumably goes to Rich's house, another man thought to be involved with selling drugs. He spends 20 minutes talking to him before returning home. Minutes later, Solomon is dead to be found two days later and reported via a 911 call placed by Ronaldo. In my opinion, this argument with his father and then briefly speaking with Rich absolutely could have something to do with his death. It cannot be a coincidence that all of this happens, Solomon finally puts his foot down, it seems, and says that he wants to leave Detroit for good. He has his car packed up, he's ready to leave, but then he just dies. And after his death, his father and stepmother, for some reason, worked tirelessly to make sure that everybody forgot about what happened. It's not normal. It's suspicious. So, to summarize at this point, it appears that Solomon had been selling drugs with Ronaldo, Rich, and possibly other associates. He wanted to leave, but they wanted to prevent him from doing so. So, allegedly, something that had to do with all of this led to his death. As of right now, Solomon's mother and brother are doing what they can to get the word out about his death. Local police refuse to look back into the case even when they are presented with all of this new information. Sophia and Ramses have taken to TikTok to spread awareness about the case and get more people involved. They really do need a push from the public to get Solomon's story out there and really put pressure on local detectives to reopen this case. Since starting the TikTok, Sophia has received many threatening comments and messages presumed to be from family members who maybe don't want this case to go back to the authorities. They've commented that Sophia is crazy. They have even threatened her, saying, you're gonna get yours. Ronaldo has allegedly disclosed that Sophia is suicidal, even though she isn't. Sophia fully takes this as a threat. Because all of this information came directly from the family, I'm not going to make any accusations or go too far into theories for this case. My goal for this case is to present you with all of the relevant information and allow you to come to your own conclusions. If you feel like there is more going on in this case, I urge you to get involved by sharing and donating their GoFundMe, which can be found down below. With the GoFundMe fundraiser, they are trying to show law enforcement that we care about Solomon and that this case isn't all that it's cracked up to be. This isn't just a cut and dry suicide. It's a case that deserves to be investigated to the full extent of law enforcement capabilities. You can also follow their TikToks and stay up to date with the case that will also be linked down below. So, that is all of the information that I have for today's case. 
You've heard my thoughts. You've heard all of this information. So now I want to hear what you all think. What do you think is going on in this case? Do you think this truly was a suicide or is there foul play involved? If so, why do you think it's not being investigated? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn those notification bells to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow my Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out the Google form, which is listed down below as well. With that, hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.